Driving at Home with ABOR's Housing Economist, Claire Losey. Hey there, welcome back to the Driving at Home podcast with Dr. Claire Losey. I'm Danielle Hammett, Deputy Director of Communications at ABOR. And I'm Dr. Claire Losey, the Housing Economist here at ABOR. And we've got a nice steady week starting the first week of December and first full week. And while the holiday season may be crazy, we've got some steady eddy numbers, some good numbers to share. What are we covering this week, Dr. Losey? So we are going to talk about the PCE, which is the Personal Consumptions Expenditures Index, as well as Austin Labor Market Stats. Awesome. Well, let's get into the PCE first. What are you seeing there? So essentially, there's really good news on that front. The Personal Consumption Expenditures Index, which is essentially just another way to measure inflation when we deduct the more volatile categories of food and energy, came in at 3.5% on a year-over-year basis, rose 3.5% year-over-year in October, and then rose a pretty low number, 0.2% on a month-over-month basis. And both of those figures were in line with consensus expectations. And broadly speaking, it's just another way of measuring inflation, as we talked about before, and it's the preferred measure of the Federal Reserve just because of the methodology embedded in it. And so just the fact that the PCE index is declining, of course, as the other measures of inflation, such as the CPI and the Consumer Price Index and the PPI or the Producer Price Index are also declining on average, indicates that the Federal Reserve may actually be done with its rate hiking cycle. So right now, the market is pricing in a 97% probability that the Federal Reserve will opt not to hike rates in December and may actually even start cutting rates in 2024. Wow, that's awesome news. So the next meeting for the Fed is probably here in a couple of weeks. And then when would they meet again in 2024? So they'll meet in mid-December of this year and then the meeting in January. It's really a January-February meeting. It's January 31st and February 1st. Okay, so if they lower rates in January-February, when will we start to see that impact in the housing market for mortgage rates? So we've already seen that the 10-year Treasury yield has declined over the past several weeks. It's now hovering around about 4.3% down from its you know 4.9% levels that we were seeing in October. So that has already helped to deflate mortgage rates slightly. They came in at around 7.2%. Last week. And so essentially, what that all means is that as there's a little bit more certainty within the market that the Federal Reserve will probably opt not to hike rates in December, and it's probably done with its rate hiking cycle in general, there's a little bit more certainty in the markets now than there was previously. That should help at least, if not stabilize, the 10 year Treasury yield actually help to decelerate it a little bit. It should moderate somewhat with that news. And so essentially that should also indicate that mortgage rates should continue to gradually decline as we've seen over the past couple of weeks, again, in line with the 10-year treasury yields decline. And if the Federal Reserve opts to cut rates in 2024, it should have an indirect effect on mortgage rates, again, via the 10 year treasury yield. And so we should see that mortgage rates would again moderate if it were the case that the Federal Reserve opts to cut rates in 2024. Nice. Okay. So let, that was part one. Let's recap. Inflation trends are finally starting to tick downward. So inflation is setting out, and we're thinking that there are not only will there not be another rate hike. Uh, by the end of the year, but in the interest rates may actually go down in the Fed's first meeting of the year in January, February, which means that we're expecting that mortgage rates will follow suit. So that's super good news for agents in the market right now, and um, both for sellers with getting increased interest from buyers in the market and anyone wanting to enter the housing market and buy a home in the next quarter. That's awesome. 
So let's take it back here locally. You're going to talk some latest, the freshest job numbers. What you got, Dr. Losey? We're looking now at October job numbers, right? And so essentially what we're seeing is that on a year-over-year basis, employment growth is slowing. So measured about 3% in the Austin, Round Rock, Georgetown MSA versus about 3.9% in the DFW region, 2.5% in Houston, and 3.2% in the San Antonio MSA. So across the board, employment growth has decelerated over the past several months. However, we have to remember that there were very strong job gains, especially towards the middle part of 2021 and even moving into 2022, just as the economy was recovering the jobs that were lost at the height of the COVID pandemic, right, in March, April, and May of 2020, especially. So now that we have kind of exceeded that hurdle, so to speak, we are now entering into kind of that post-pandemic territory. We are seeing some normalization with jobs growth. And with respect to the unemployment rate, it remains at historic lows across the board, especially in Austin, came in at 3.3% in October versus 3.6% in the DFW area, 4.1% in the Houston MSA, and 3.6% in the San Antonio region. So, of course, among the four major MSAs in Texas, Austin, boosted the lowest unemployment rate in October. Meanwhile, with respect to wage growth, we've also seen decelerating wage gains. And this is due to a couple of factors, right? Of course, it's in tandem with the decline in the rate of job growth, right? So the deceleration in job growth that we've seen. But it's also just in line with the deceleration in inflation that we've also seen over the past several months upwards of a year now. So for example, in the earlier stages of this year, we are even seeing wage gains of upwards of 5%, now hovering closer to 3% in October for the Austin, Round Rock, Georgetown MSA. So overall, the labor market is performing well, but normalizing, again, with respect to the broader context of being in this kind of post-pandemic economy, you know, fully recovered essentially from the pandemic. That is all good news. It's not a surprise necessarily that if you've been in the real estate market for some time, you know that the Austin area has largely been resilient to economic downturns and were the last to feel the effects and the first to normalize, it seems like. And so it's really nice to hear that we have Still historic lows for unemployment. Um, I'm going to ask kind of a dumb question, but for the wage growth numbers, how is that calculated? Because could it just be that, like, say, I get the tie to inflation and why, like, offers and wages would respond accordingly, but could it just be that maybe a lot of, like, more, like, manufacturing jobs, like, it depends on what kind of, or high-tech jobs hit the market. Um, How does that impact the numbers? Sure. That's a great question. So when we're thinking about wage growth, as you touched on, Danielle, we're looking at the distribution of wage growth among different industries or different job sectors, right? For example, information, financial activities, mining and logging, construction, et cetera. All of those different sectors that compile the labor market So any individual job gain or loss within those sectors is, of course, going to affect wage growth. So if we're thinking about, for example, the information sector, we know that tech has taken a little bit of a hit right over the past year or two now. And so, you know, the moderation in wages that we've seen in the tech industry is going to be reflected in the average wage growth number for the Austin MSA. And of course, as the tech industry represents a larger share of the Austin economy than it does in other regions, it's going to have a bigger effect. Its magnitude on wage growth is going to be somewhat larger. So that's a great point just in elucidating, again, the effect of any individual job sector 
on wage growth numbers and thinking more holistically just about how trends in any individual job sector are going to potentially affect that final wage growth number. Got it. Thank you for explaining that. That's something I've always wondered. Lastly, let's talk weekly stats. Guys, we're recording this one a little bit early. Um, So this week for today's episode, we're going to be comparing the week before Thanksgiving housing market data and the week after Thanksgiving for our five-county MSA. Dr. Losey, and I've always wondered this too, is the week before Thanksgiving higher performing or the week after? What we found, at least this year, is that the week before Thanksgiving was a little bit higher performing. And that's somewhat unsurprising, right? Folks are trying to get deals in the door, you know, finalized before they head out for the break or before they headed out for the break. So what we saw really is that when we're thinking about the Friday before Thanksgiving through Thanksgiving Day relative to Black Friday through this past Thursday, Closed sales declined about 23% and pending sales declined about 19%. Meanwhile, there is an uptick in active listings and new listings to the tune of 4% and 7% respectively. So a little bit more activity in bringing homes onto the market, right? But less activity kind of in the sense of like offloading homes, if that makes sense. And then just from your perspective, we'll know the numbers when they get here, but from from your experience, what do we expect to happen with that inventory as we close out the year, which crazily 2024 is four weeks away. What typically do we see as we wrap a year? So when we think about the housing market, we generally, for any individual year, we're thinking in terms of cycles with respect to just seasonal fluctuations in activity. So we know that the spring and summer months tend to be Uh, more popular months for home buying and selling, whereas the winter months, especially as we're moving into the end of the year, the beginning of the following year, we tend to see a little bit of a decline in activity. That's nothing new and it's nothing unique to the Austin market. So generally speaking, we'd expect that over the next couple of weeks, activity may decline a little bit, but of course, it's just a part of a broader seasonal trend. So things will things will come back, so to speak. Well, there was still plenty of good news to end the year with that I know a lot of our listeners are going to take back to their clients, most notably that interest rates are not only going to hold steady, most likely, but economists are saying they they may actually start to fall next year, which is would be a big relief for buyers and great news for everyone. That's all we have for this week. But before you guys hop off, be sure to hit the subscribe button if you are listening to this on Spotify, actually all of our podcast networks. But if you're still listening on YouTube, we're still going to be there, but you can also get it delivered right to your app through your favorite podcasting app every Tuesday morning. Just pound that follow button or give us a review. We'd really appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Have a good week.